Welcome, everybody, to uh, Catching Steam, System-Wide Sustainable Change to School Culture and Climate. OK, the point of today is my assumption that all of you have some sort of vision in your head of what your ideal thoughts are on education. So what I want you to do right now is we're going to start with what that vision is. And I want you to think about what does it look like to you. I want you to think about, you know, suddenly your fairy godmother came along and said, here's a lot of money. And all of these political and, and you know, social and administrative things that are in your way are now poof, gone. OK? You've got your entire vision. And you just get to create on this canvas. What does that look like? So on your packets, there's that question. Please write it down. And then what does it sound like? Like, close your eyes, think about it. Like, when, when your vision is complete and somebody walks in the room, what are they seeing? What does it sound like? If you're a district, what does that feel like? Right? Organizations, institutions, what does this vision have substance? Give it some substance. What will people be doing? And then, what is everyone's role? Now, as you're thinking about this vision, I want you to think about this as your North Star. This is what you're going to be working toward. Okay? So, you've got this down. You've talked about what it looks like, sounds like, feels like, what people are doing, who's being involved in all of this. What do you need? So here's Fairy Godmother standing in front. She's like, OK, I got my empty cart. What do you need to fill it with? What do you need? So I wanted to start with this vision, because we're going to kind of work through some of these steps so that by the end of today, you'll have a plan for how to get started. Some of you may even have a complete plan for how you're just going to totally go out there and crush it. OK? So I'm going to start with a story. Um, or actually, I should back up. I should introduce myself, shouldn't I? <laughs> OK, my name is Jan Verhoeven, and I am president of Key Learning Research Group. Um, I am also the author of Rebel Teaching, How to Repurpose the American Education Machine. It's about being able to pursue your dreams in education, and again, what does that look like, sound like, feel like? What people will be doing in it? What's everybody's roles and what do you need? Okay? Now, for this book, I interviewed people from like all over the world that had accomplished their vision. So what I'm going to share with you today are some of those things that they did to actually accomplish it. I'm going to start with a woman, Christy Tolliver. She is a tech coordinator at a district in uh, Missouri. And she was faced with this question. Now, a lot of you probably are on the Google system in your schools, yes? Anybody on Microsoft? OK, two. So this was, I would say, about five years ago. Everybody else went to Google Classroom except Christie's district. They went to Microsoft. She had a bunch of teachers who were like, why not Google? Because Google is almost in everything, and now you're asking us to do Microsoft, right? So she had a bit of an issue of, how do I change and convince my audience that this is something that can help them with their job? Now, as you probably know, think about your staff and faculty meetings. You've got people who are like, yes, I want this, right? And then you've got people that are like, uh-huh. You know what I mean, right? And then there are the people that are still asleep in the back. The problem, though, is when you're trying to change culture, you have to think, how do I get all of these people involved? And so to face that problem, 
I'm going to introduce a concept by Jeffrey Moore from his book, Crossing the Chasm. And what he says is, in any audience, in any culture, in any group of people, there are about five different ways people deal with a new idea, new technology, so on and so forth, OK? There are five different people. Let's see. You've got your innovators and your early adopters, right? Innovators, anybody seen those like um, Apple glasses that are coming out? OK, right? Like I was when like I was like yes I want this now right like already saving for it okay innovators first time comes out I want it right now you've got the early adopters right after that those are the people that are like all right I kind of want it but three thousand is a little bit too much I'm gonna wait until it comes down and all the bugs are kind of you know fixed right but I still want it it's still new it's shiny and I really want it you guys in here are on this side right so I want you to imagine this as a seesaw. So when you're trying to um, change school culture, you're here, everybody else is here. You've got some of your early adopters, right? Like I said, some of them are just kind of waiting for you know, the right budget, the right amount, whatever it is. Then you've got your early majority. These early majority folks are pragmatists. They're like, I don't want to change unless I have a good reason to and I know it works, right? So those are your early majority. Then you've got your late majority. Your late majority are the ones that are like, it works. I've used it for years. There's no reason I should change. I'm just going to stick with this way. Some of you are nodding because you know exactly who I'm talking about. Right? OK. And then you have the laggards. The laggards are the ones that have designated themselves in opposition to you no matter what you say. Right? Like, you say, let's have ice cream. They say, it's too cold. Right? You say, you know, let's go out. They say, I want to stay in. For the only reason is they just don't like you. They don't want that idea, whatever it is. They're the laggards. OK? But here's the thing that Christy knew. You don't have to convince everybody. You don't. You only need to convince enough people so that shift happens. Shift happens. OK? So your focus is going to be on these early adopters and early majority. You get enough of them to tilt, and now you're going to get what's called critical mass. The idea starts to catch in. Okay? So, so here's the first lesson. You want to put your most effort in empowering your early adopters and your early majority. Now, what I want you to do is in your, sh in your uh, packet, there are two questions about that. Who are these people in your network? You can go ahead and name them. I'm not going to ask you guys to exchange packets so you can hide them. You can nickname them if you want to. But just identify who these people are, right? Your innovators and your early adopters. The ones that are probably going to be on your side, they're going to be with you, right? They probably already are. As soon as you talk, you know they're going to take that idea right away. OK? Now, here's the other question that helps convince these folks. How will your vision benefit them? So how will your vision help them? Go ahead and write that down. Start thinking about it. All right? Because this is how you sell it to people. It's not what you want. It's what you want, how, how the things you have are going to benefit the other people. But the point is, and this is the reason why I asked you to write down your vision in the, in the first place. Because, sorry guys, but you're all low nuts right now. <laughs> but that's OK. I am too. And I actually have started a lot of different programs by being the lone nut. And I've talked to a lot of people who are also low nuts. And guess what? We're not low nuts anymore in here, are we? <laughs> right? OK, let's. So first thing, recap. You've got to have the guts to stand out. If the vision has always been in your head and your heart, it's now time to be out in the open. It's now time to share that vision and talk about how that vision is going to help other people. OK? The next thing is, just like in the video, you've got to make it easy for people to follow. Remember why I asked, what is everybody's role? This is why. You've got to think about how to make it easy to follow. And then finally, here's that tipping point. You remember that teeter-totter I talked about? 
you're not the one that needs to convince people. Your early adopters and early majority are going to do that for you as long as you make it easy for other people to follow and you encourage others on how to follow. Okay? So I'm going to go back and talk about Christy. In her first year, the first thing she did was she didn't force anybody to do anything. Instead, she just invited everybody to come and see all of the fun, wonderful, shiny new tools that Microsoft had to offer for her classes. She talked about some of the benefits, but the biggest thing that she did was give everybody access and share these tools. She talked about her vision of, hey guys, we got this great big grant, we've got these tools, and now I'm here to help you guys use them. And as you know, I'm sure, all of you have some early adopters, right? As soon as they see the tools, they're going to try them out. That was year one. She put all her support in those innovators and early adopters. Those innovators and early adopters created the lessons. They taught them in the classroom. And as soon as they started teaching them in the classroom, she said, hey, some of that grant money, I'm going to have you go and observe these classrooms and see what they're doing. I want you to just talk about it, converse about it. I'm going to show you. Now, this was the first year. During the summer, she created a boot camp. But she was not the one that taught. Instead, she encouraged her teachers to create little workshops, very similar to a conference like this, where each teacher could pick a tool or something that they could use and share with the people that attended. The other teachers, right, we're talking about the other early majority, the late majority, and the laggards got to choose which tools they wanted to go into. So notice something. She didn't force any of this. She gave people choice, but she empowered. She made it easy for the early adopters to show everyone else how to follow. Okay, so how are you going to make it easy for people to follow you? There's the next question. What can you do? By year three, she had this. By year three, because she gave everybody all of that support, most of those folks already converted over, or they were starting to, because they had so much support. But now they had a community, right? They got to see how it was used. These guys, she still had a few, right? About a third of her school were still the um, late majority and the laggards. So there's a couple reasons why people tend to be resistant. I'm going to share some of those with you, OK? The first is from this book. It's one of my favorite quotes. People cannot choose what they have not seen or experienced. I used to run workshops, and when I got people like this, I would do this. <laughs> and it didn't work. <laughs> I was so angry. It's like, why can't you just you know, follow, right? And it's because they may not have ever seen it, especially when you have a general society parents, right? Sometimes administrators, sometimes teachers, who think this is what the classroom should look like, the teacher in front, the students in the back. I'm willing to bet in some of your workshops, he's like, uh-uh, right? We have to show them that it should look more like this, right? This is actually a STEAM lesson. The kids were actually creating um, Ooblick, and then they were doing experiments with it. I even had glitter folks. It was pretty fun. But it was about giving people the idea of what your vision looks like. You've got to show them. You've got to make it public. You've got to like share newsletters and emails, right? That wonderful sheet that you received in the beginning with all those art statistics, that should be in the hands of your parents and your families and your administrators. 
should be in the hands of your teachers. Hey guys, over coffee, did you know that if you did more art in your classroom, you would raise your reading scores by 10%, right? Let them know, okay? So people cannot choose what they have not seen or experienced, so you've got to show them your vision. All right, next, there are other reasons for resistance. The first is this one, right? This is really common. I run into this a lot with people who uh, teach STEM and they're resistant because they're not quote unquote science or math people. And unfortunately, studies show that that phobia actually gets passed down to students because they're afraid of it, right? There's a fear of failure. I've never done this before. I'm not sure how to do it. Um, Susan Riley this morning in her workshop talked about co-teaching, being able to collaborate with other teachers and that's something that you, you may want to think about, right? Um, there's also maybe a misunderstanding or no understanding. There's a history behind some of the reasons people resist. And one of those could be, and I've been told this, you're just another fad and you're going to go away, right? So the best thing to do is to be able to say, here's why this is important. Here's the studies that show this. Here's how it happens. Oh, here's a testimonial from my student who absolutely loves my class, right? Use that, show them so that they understand the why behind the reason. They have a distrust in leadership. Sometimes these are especially your laggards, right? Maybe historically they've had bad experiences. You come into the picture and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I don't trust you either. So it's about developing that relationship. Sometimes these folks just want to be heard. They just want to know that they're heard, they're validated, they're acknowledged. And it's oftentimes good. A lot of the people that I find are resistant. I sit and have a conversation, and it's like, oh, OK. And it actually makes your vision better, OK? And then, um, of course, we talked about this resistance is part of a laggard's identity. OK, there's several ways to deal with that. But here's the other thing, especially when you first introduce a concept, there is a biological physiological thing that happens called the amygdala tingle, okay? And the amygdala is this little almond-shaped thing in the back of your head, and it basically regulates the three Fs, fight, flight, and procreation. So when <laughs> you talk about somebody's beliefs, it feels like a threat, especially in education because everybody um, has experience with education, they think they have a preconceived belief of what education should be, right? So when you come in and you introduce this new idea, it's almost like this knee-jerk overreaction, a defensiveness. That's the amygdala tingle. There's a couple ways that you can overcome that. One is try and find common ground. One of the things that I've done, especially when I'm introducing something very new to people, I ask them, why do you teach? Why did you sign up for this? What drives you to do these things? And oftentimes, there's a lot of commonality there. Start with that. We all want the same thing. Educate and give examples. That's that visualization, right? Plant the seeds and persist. The amygdala tingle is a fear. It's, it's an automatic fear reaction. You know how like sometimes you know, something happens, like my husband, for instance, tiny spider, lands on him and he like screams and just like totally backs away. Um, and then he realizes it's a tiny spider, he's like, oh, okay, right? It's the seed. Sometimes people will totally resist you at the start, but then you just chip away at it, okay? You just chip away at it. And then eventually that seed might actually sprout, especially when they see other people that are doing it. And then go around them. Depending on your situation, there are ways to go around them. I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay, so lesson two, have a plan for your laggards. You know who they are. Are you going to plant the seeds? Are you going to give them time? Are you going to go around them? Think about what you might want to do. Okay? All right, so who are they? Think about what some of the reasons might be that they're resisting you. 
If you can find the underlying reason, then you might, might be able to get through to them. But understand, this is not going to be a majority of where you want to sit. Like, your energy should not be with the laggards. Your energy should be where? Say it. Early adopters and early majority. Right? OK, so the way you go around and the way you go through is what I call a senius, OK? And a senius was actually a term coined by Brian Eno, an artist. And what he talked about is instead of communities, you develop collective genius, people who come together to collectively support and problem solve by leveraging their individual experiences and knowledge. In classrooms, I encourage teachers to use the senius because what that does is it assumes everybody in the room has something of value to share. Everybody in the room is an expert and we need their expertise in order to collectively problem solve and learn together. The other thing, and this is something that um, Susan had talked about in the keynote, right? Shake up your boundaries. So the seniors is about shaking up your boundaries, and here's why. We often think in education, I know some of you are not in education, but this hierarchy still kind of exists, right? You've got this top-down chain of command. Here's the problem with that top-down chain of command. If you're found in this, and there's a lot of pressure for you on any one of these, it's only as strong as the weakest link. When that person leaves, the program does not persist. We all have seen that, right? So what you need to do is actually build this, a supportive ecosystem. But you've got to do it by bringing more people in, community, school staff, school board, businesses, right? Organizations, families. This is how you start to build your seniors. You share your vision with the people outside of that hierarchy. Remember what I said, right? You can go over them, under them, through them, or around them. You've got to find your early adopters and your innovators. They may not be in your district, in your school, in your organization, but they will be in your community. The other thing I want to highlight is we often underestimate students. But students can be one of your biggest allies. I actually had an art teacher who came to me and she's like, I am so sick and tired of other teachers pulling my kids out of my class because they think that this is just playtime for them. And they don't understand that they're learning important things. So what I told her is, have the kids tell the other teachers that this time is for them <laughs> and that they are being affected by the learning, right? You've got to teach them that language as well. You've got to think about ways that your students can actually voice these things for you. Students are the innovators. They are the early adopters. And they are your majority. So take advantage of that. And I'll give you an example of how that happens. So you build your ecosystem by inviting participation. Okay? This is my son, Davis. He, when he was 16, he wanted to create science in the city which was a connection between businesses, high school students, and high school students with middle school students. And the stipulation he told me was, mom, stay out of it, and no adults are going to be teaching this. This was completely student run. He is presenting in front of the school board. And he is talking about how he already has support from the Ames City Council and the Ames Public Library and several local businesses. He also went to the Governor's Iowa uh, STEM Advisory Board, got $15,000 from the STEM Best Grant. He went outside the hierarchy. He created his own ecosystem. So question for you, who do you need? Who can give you these things? How will you invite them to participate? So. Here's some ways to share your vision. Celebrate those successes, just like Christy Tolliver did. Talk about the good. Share stories. Bring stuff from the media. Bring statistics. Hold town hall meetings. I believe in your packet, and if it's not there, I'll make sure it's there. East High School in Rochester, New York, I used to work um, and run a science program out there. 
had a 33% graduation rate in 2014. They completely turned everything around when they said, we're bringing in student voice. We're bringing in distributed leadership. It is now 85% graduation rate, completely turned around. So there's an article that talks about how you can bring in student town hall meetings. It's very powerful. Um, you can have STEAM, arts, science, family, and community events. I know one school where what they did is during the holidays, um, Iowa Extension, ISU Extension does like a mousetrap challenge. So kids de design mousetraps according to the, uh, oh, what's that ballet in the, in the holidays? I can't, Nutcracker, right? They do a STEM door decoration contest where they put circuits into their door decorations. But it's a challenge that's school-wide. So being able to bring some of these ideas in in a school-wide way or inviting parents to come even after school to check out your program, bringing people into your classroom, breaking down those borders so they can see the wonderful things you're doing is a powerful way to get them to become your advocates. Okay, blog, newsletter. There are students, high school students, that write their own blogs. You can invite them to write about you. Bring in newsletters, Twitter. In other words, communicate. Take over the narrative of what people are saying. Because if you don't, somebody else will do it for you. Okay? And then ask for help. That's how you build the seniors. Some of you might think about your local businesses. I tell you something, businesses are dying for opportunities to help out schools. So go out and ask them. Tell them exactly what you want, what you're going to accomplish, how this will benefit students, and how that's going to give the business a good name for helping the community. That's how you get funding, because people never say no to funding or children. It's a trick. I learned that. <laughs> OK? All right. So again, it starts here. Your seniors, here's just a list of suggestions for you. You want one or two teachers from grades before and after yours. You also want teachers in your seniors. When I started my biotech program at the high school, I came to my principal and said, I need $10,000 to run this program for the first semester. <laughs> and she, she was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and then I went to our local biotech company, and I said, would you adopt me as a teacher? Sure. Here's the program I want to have. This is how much it's costing. OK, here's your check. Oh, by the way, we're going to pay for a bus so that your biotech students can come and take a personalized tour of our biotech facility. That's the power of these partnerships. Okay? Um, I used to sit together with other teachers and lesson plan out things. Some of you are thinking about the transcurricular pieces. Pull some of those teachers aside. Talk about common themes and topics. How can you collaborate and share? What's your superpower? What can your organization, your school, your teaching specialty, what is it that you can offer to another school, another organization, another, right? Like, what, what is that superpower? What resources do you have? So you have a vision. You know what you need. All of your visions, your visions are so important in changing the way education is right now. We have a youth mental health crisis. Almost 40% of our high school students are suffering from some sort of form of sadness, depression, unhappiness. And to me, this is one of the reasons why I love being involved in art, because I think art and play need to come back into education. This is how we help our students. You all have the gifts that our society needs. And what I'm asking you all to do is to share those gifts with the world. Hopefully, I've given you some tools to do that. You also have my book to do that, too. OK? But my mentor used to ask me this question when I was a high school teacher. He said, if not you, then who? Why not you? Why not? If not now, then when? Why not now? when you are needed the most. I want to end with this statement. Those who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>